The Byte Show is listener supported at thebyteshow.com. The Byte Show is sponsored by Deep Cello Coffee, perhaps the best coffee on this or any other planet. Hello, everybody. This is George Ann Hughes, and this is The Bite Show. And we are really blessed tonight. We have Joseph P. Farrell with us. You can email Joseph at the following email address. It is Vardis, that's V is in Victor, A-R-D is in David, A-S, then the number 3, at AOL.com. And I want to also ask everybody uh, if you can donate something to Joseph for his work please do there is a PayPal button on his website at GizaDeathStar.com please set that PayPal button on fire with donations will you I know that uh, many many people the world over listen to these audio files with Joseph and we want to keep him writing and researching and the way to do that is to help this man uh, so use that P- PayPal button up there um, okay by golly Joseph P. Farrell as most of these listeners out here know he is a brilliantly gifted researcher and a very prolific author he holds a doctorate in pastoristics from the University of Oxford. He has published four previous works. Also, uh, aside from his works on uh, Nazis and technologies, uh, he had previous works on theology. He recently moved back to his home state of South Dakota, and he pursues research on his other loves, and hobbies, which include classical music. He is an organist. He plays the harpsichord, and he is a genuine composer of classical music, physics, alternative history, science, and just all kinds of -of out-of-the-box strange stuff. So here we have our favorite, Joseph P. Farrell, with us tonight. And this will be in the order of our Cosmic War series. This will be number 12. And Joseph also has new books coming out. I have to do some updating on his page here at the uh, Bite Show. And uh, he's got a lot to tell us tonight. Hi, Joseph. Hey, George Ann. Thanks for having me back on. Oh, you're welcome here anytime. Well, what? Okay. Joseph, there's just all kinds of new stuff going on. Oh, boy, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that the truth? I mean, uh, nothing's being hidden anymore. (laughs) No, it's it's kind of pretty much out there right now, pretty much in everybody's face. (laughs) Yeah, for those with eyes to see. Yeah, right. What about this Hadron Collider? Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know if your listeners know the story, but basically uh, the the CERN uh, European Nuclear Research Agency built a large uh, hadron collider in Switzerland. It's, this is a gigantic uh, circular ring of, interestingly enough, two counter-rotating uh, magnets uh, encircling this ring that will spin these protons up and then collide them, hopefully, and then uh, the thinking is, is out of the collision, they're going to discover the so-called Higgs boson, which is a, a long sought-after particle that will vindicate some of the theoretical physics predictions. Don't uh, they fan- call that the God particle? Yeah, sort of, yeah. yeah. It, it's a... It's a uh, it's an artifact of, of some of the standard theoretical physics that you find in this country and, and uh, Western Europe concerning string theory and so on and so forth, and part of the standard model of quantum mechanics. And uh, well, as as most people probably know, they they turned on the switch, so to yeah. speak, you know. And there was actually a movement that was begun in Germany by a, a chemist, a German chemist to prevent them from doing this because he raised the concern that, you know, well, if they're going to try and create these little mini black holes in this thing, uh, there is a a 
slight statistical potential risk that they're going to create a big black hole, and, you know, we can all just kind of bend over and kiss ourselves <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, they turned this thing on, and shortly after they did so, they noticed an anomalous rise in the heat of some of these magnets. Now, I should explain that the magnets surrounding the, the tracks on this accelerator were supercooled uh, to a very, very, very few degrees Kelvin, which is just, you know, really, really cold. <laughs> yeah. And uh, within a few minutes, I believe it was, they, they noticed about a four degree rise in some of these magnets, which was just, you know, uh, not good. So they had to shut the thing down because of, of coolant problems on, on these superconducting magnets. Well, my guess is, and it's purely a guess here, uh, although I, I have had some emails from people claiming to be inside sources and knowing what's going on, but, uh, you know, that, that could be neither here nor there. But my guess on, on what has happened was this, is that they did indeed have something happen, and that the story of the the anomalous temperature rise in the coolant on these magnets is in fact true but as part of this story they are putting out that it was just basically an equipment malfunction i don't think that this is the case i think that they did find something truly anomalous but that it didn't fit in with the theoretical paradigm that that they thought that they were investigating that's the clincher so they turned the thing off, you know, they pressed the panic button and shut the thing down. Yeah. And uh, I, I rather suspect that what has happened is rather similar to what happened that we've talked about so many times before. That, uh, you know, when they set off the first big H-bombs, they, they got these <laughs> very high yields that were yeah. way beyond what they had calculated for the devices that they were blowing up. And uh, I suspect that something similar has happened here, that, that something happened that was not within the paradigm of, of the theory, and that they were getting these anomalous returns, and it, it literally sent them scrambling back to the blackboards to figure out, you know, just what the heck happened here. My guess is, is that with this counter-rotation and, and the enormous energies that they were doing and using in this collider, and, and I should mention that when they turned this thing on, they were powering up to full power. They hadn't even reached it yet. Yeah. So my suspicion is is that, you know, with this counter-rotation, that they accessed some sort of torsion effect by, by dint of that counter-rotation. You know, this is the same principle that, at work in the bell. Mm -hmm. And that as a result of this, you know, they weren't expecting what happened, and they had to shut the thing down before they proceeded any further because they just didn't really know what they were looking at. So I suspect that uh, it's going to be a while before we hear again from the Hadron Collider, if we hear anything at all. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah. Oh. So uh, you know, it's definitely a story to it's definitely a story to keep watching among all the other stories that we've got to keep watching right now. Oh my gosh, yeah, you know, Google has got to release to, uh, these ultra sharp image uh, mapping thing. Um, you know, and before uh, all this years ago, you could they said you could see a flea on a. Uh, a gnat's nut, you know. Right, exactly. Uh, and now they say it's even sharper. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, it is. The, the satellite imaging capability that they have now is, is just truly kind of frightening. Um, yeah. And you couple that with, with their ability to do radar, <coughs> excuse me, radar tomography from space now. Right. You know, which means the ground penetrating radar and, and the ability to see beneath the surface to a certain extent. Uh, this really is is a frightening frightening world we're entering, and oh, yes. uh, you know it's it's uh, it's to the point now. I think you know that we have to. Well, let, let me put it this way: everybody knows about the economic meltdown. I'm sure. I mean that's uh, that's fairly self evident. Yeah. But what I'm constantly saying to people is that we are looking. You know, I, I'm not as panicked as most people are. I'm not either because I don't have any money. Well, you know, me neither. But <laughs> besides, isn't it nice? <laughs> besides that, you know, besides that problem, 
Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone's kind of uh, wringing their hands that this is the beginning of the new world order, the beginning of the end, and so on and so forth. I don't yeah. quite view it that way because – the way I view it is that, that the Anglo-American banking establishment that's basically been running things for the last hundred years, to me they're showing too many signs of panic. Yeah. In other words, I think the panic is genuine, and I think someone else is holding the gun to their head. Good they, point. Yeah, I, I think someone else is, and it's not too hard to see who some of those characters are. I mean, you know, Russia and China are already, are already hopping mad. And quite frankly, I don't blame them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'd be hopping mad too. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you've got the t you've got the elites in those countries that are certainly uh, now publicly calling for an end to the current uh, global financial system, which basically is is a nice euphemism for a way to express the end of the Anglo-American financial hegemony. Uh, you know the private bankers in Wall Street and, and uh, yeah. the City of London and so on. But uh, what do you think they're going to replace it with? Well, uh, there there are the typical cries for some sort of global currency or even regional currencies. I don't think those will work. They may try them, but I don't think those things will work. Uh, you know, you sent me an article just before this interview about the fact that uh, the FBI and other U.S. intelligence agencies are now alarmed over the hidden microchips that the People's Republic of China has been putting into our computers. Computers, you know? yeah, exactly. Well, you know, that's, that to me, as I indicated in my response to your email, that to me is another little indicator that all this, you know, lovely pie-in-the-sky globalism and regionalism is collapsing. Yeah because you have a segment of the intelligence community saying, whoa, you know, even even the New World Order crowd has to be uh, terribly disturbed by that. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> so uh, we're looking, I think, at, at the first cracks and fissures, and uh, I think, you know, in terms of, of what we're talking about before this economic situation, the way I read it, George Ann, is that there is now factional infighting within the New World Order as to who's going to be on top of the heap. Yeah. And the Anglo-American banking establishment, you know, the Morgan Rockefeller, Rothschild, Warburg uh, group of thugs, gangs, uh, criminals, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> reprobates of various degrees, right. uh, that this group of people is being severely challenged by other factions within that overall agenda. Yes. One of them, I honestly believe, is some sort of modern version of the Nazi International, and let me explain why. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh, John. Um, Absolutely. Which, you know, you mentioned the two books, the other books. I have two books right now in press. Right. Uh, one of them is called The Philosopher's Stone, and the publisher of that is Farrell House, F-E-A-R-F-E-R-A-L, there we are. Uh, that should be coming out sometime in February. And then uh, the other one is called The Nazi International. Uh, the subtitle to that, I think, will give away the game. The <laughs> subtitle to that is The Nazis' Post-War Plan for the Control of Finance, Conflict, space, and energy. Wow. Okay? Now, the reason I think that some of this factional infighting is literally the gun being held to the head of the Anglo-American establishment, not just by the Russian elite and the Chinese elite and the Japanese and so on, but very possibly by this very hidden Nazi international, which has played such a tremendous, though largely unknown, role in post-war uh, European politics and the establishment of the European Union and the reunification of Germany itself, believe it or not. Uh, I sent you that email link of, of the German army on parade. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh my it's, goodness. it's very yeah. creepy when you look at this and yeah. see all these uh, old traditions that they've yeah. revived. Exactly. Know? But um, the reason I say that, that we may be looking at some sort of real fascist international is that at the end of World War II, and I document this in the Nazi International, the Nazi party, largely under the leadership of Martin Bormann, had squirreled away some $800 million in liquid cash. Oh, my goodness. 
not to mention 95 tons of gold, several tons of platinum, diamonds, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it, you, you translate that into modern-day dollars from 1945, and you have approximately, uh, I think I calculated about $16 billion of just liquid cash you could move around. This does not include the art treasures and, and things of that nature that, that could be sold at auction. Yeah. So in other words, you have... Uh, so you have quite a deal of financial leverage, and incidentally, much of this money was placed precisely into the banks that formed the core of the Anglo-American establishment. And as late as 1967, I mentioned this in the new book, Martin Borman draws a check for about $2.7 million under his own signature <laughs> from Chase Manhattan. <laughs> so, you know... If that doesn't tell part of the story. A Rockefeller <laughs> Bank. A Rockefeller Bank. Yeah. Okay, so in other words, you know, there's a lot of money to loan these people. Oh, you sure? Okay. But with the Nazis, you're dealing with a different thing. You're dealing with people that not only have money, but they have people. Oh, yeah. They have an intelligence network. They have the ability, mafia style, to enforce compliance or else. Yeah. And I think we're seeing some dynamic along these lines playing out here. Uh, I think I think not only have Russia and China and uh, a bunch of other people pulled the plug on this, I think also that there is pressure from other hidden players like this against the Anglo-American establishment, and, and that's the reason we have for this panic. They're calling in the markers. Oh, uh, and you know you put you put all that in perspective of, of some of the things that, that uh, Mr. Hoagland and Mr. Barra uh, believe and have talked about in terms of an overarching scenario, and it's, it's looking pretty bleak. Oh, yeah. But you know the good news is is that these people are now showing signs of panic and infighting amongst themselves. And and to me, you know, this house of cards was was doomed to fail from the outset, and, sure. and I think that's what we're potentially looking at if things go well. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of a long, long uh, version of it, but uh, that, that's kind of what I think is going on. Well, it's uh, certainly a lot, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and none of it is uh, none of it is good. I mean, no. not for for us, the, no. the people. No. And you know, when you look also, Joseph, there is a huge number, a rising number of people in this in our country that are committing suicide. Oh yes, yeah, I know. Because they're being made homeless. Yes. I mean even people paying their rent in rentals. Right. The apartment buildings are going into foreclosure and right. suddenly overnight you're homeless. Right. You know? Right. It you know, it's it's a situation that uh we're witnessing also, as far as I'm concerned, the breakdown of party ideology. In, in other words, the Democrats and the Republicans are just not going to be able to get away with playing the, the uh, big government versus free market ideological game anymore. Yeah. Because neither one have worked. This whole derivatives crisis was brought about basically by an unregulated free market in a particular area of the economy. And uh, on the other on the other side, you know, simply having big government step in and, and nationalize all these institutions, well, that's not solving anything either. We're looking at basically the meltdown of uh, this fiat money uh, private banking system mm -hmm. uh, called the Federal Reserve, as far as I'm concerned, and none too soon. Right. Uh, it, it's going to have to go one way or the other. And, of course, the, the elite want to be in control of the other, you know. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think they're losing their grip. They've simply made too many people extremely angry. Oh, <laughs> I yes. really don't think there's any going back for them. Well, you know, when we look at this meltdown and the way the dominoes tumbled, mm -hmm. um, you could almost, I don't know, you can almost see this, invisible hand behind all this orchestrating it. I mean, right. what are the chances of dozens of gigantic corporations tumbling all at one time? Right. Well, they're they're very slim, you know. It, yeah. it, there is an orchestration to it, but 
my disagreement with uh, my good friend Jim Mars and, and some people that are interpreting this as, as a pre-planned move on the part of, of the New World Order crowd is that, number one, I don't think all the, the ducks were in a row for the New World Order crowd to pull off the agenda that, that they have in mind. So in other words, I go back to what I'm proposing as, as a possible interpretation to this, that there's some factional infighting. And the gun, the financial gun, has literally been put to the head of, of the Anglo-American establishment by uh, at least two factions within this so-called New World Order. And that uh, the real reason for bailing out these corporations is that they're trying to pay off the, the markers. And yeah. they're, not simply, they're simply not going to be able to get away with it because it won't work. Uh, so you know, rather than rather than do the logical thing, which would have been to uh, put a freeze on foreclosures and yeah. and you know do a kind of a Franklin Roosevelt New Deal type of program, mm -hmm. where you are giving payment directly to the people that need it most, namely the people, yeah. and bringing manufacturing jobs back to this country, uh, you're you're bailing out the very people that that put us into this mess That's uh, right. and you know rather than bail them out you should haul them up before a grand jury for treason as far as I'm concerned I agree with you I totally agree with you Joseph it, it, uh, to cause people to be to intentionally cause people to be homeless right. hungry uh, displaced is it, it, it's a crime against humanity well it's a crime you know it's a crime against God it's a crime yeah. against humanity in, in every classical sense exactly. and uh, anyway that's that's kind of my political take for the day <laughs> well you and I are in big agreement on well I think a lot of people are <laughs> going back to this uh, Hadron Collider did mm -hmm. anything disappear well that's that's an excellent question, and to be honest with you, I don't know. My suspicion is is that we're not being told the full story. I I believe that too. Um, <laughs> some of the some of the emails I have received suggested that there was actually a rip or a tear that occurred in some of these coolant tanks around these magnets, wow. and they could not even explain why it got there. You know, the, there's equipment malfunction, and then there's something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just I just don't think that that there's enough public data because quite honestly I don't believe the Europeans are being uh, forthcoming with it uh, to to really indicate what's going on there. So, but I do stand by my my interpretation that I think they found something that was not predicted in the standard theoretical models that they were using. Well, Joseph, a rip or a tear in some tanks. Uh, if it did that, I mean, how in the world would the scientists, uh, where would they be to protect themselves? Well, as as I understand it, the collider is built with with the control uh, house uh, much much separated from the physical collider itself. In other yeah. words, they're not in any immediate physical danger from the thing. Um, but the fact that they shut it down so yeah. quickly with with that kind of temperature rise tells me that mere equipment malfunction probably isn't the explanation. Well, I wonder if there was re residual um, problems. Well, there may have been. You know, that's more or less the line that, that CERN is putting out, that, yeah. you know, that this was an entirely explainable and ordinary type of equipment malfunction and as soon as we get it repaired we're going to be back up and online in a couple of months yeah. well we'll see yeah, right. <laughs> so, oh. my guess is is that they will come along in a couple of months and say well we're not quite ready we need to fix this we need to fix that well that's a cover story as far as i'm concerned because something like that is not going to be all that difficult for them to fix yeah. So, you know, the cover story there is, uh, you know, we, we still really don't know what's going on, but we're telling you this in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Um, in our last um, uh, session together mm -hmm. in the Cosmic War, we, I think, mentioned some things about invisibility. Oh, yes. <laughs> and... You know, in your book, 
that I have here, uh, the Giza Death Star Destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a uh, some a lot of information in there about Marduk's right. weaponry mm -hmm. and uh, stealth his stealth suit, right. uh, invisible weapon, um, and now we're coming out with a news story. Uh, it was the title of it is invisibility cloak you right. know advances in uh, optical technology right um yeah. <laughs> you know the, the more things change the more they go back to the way they were right uh, um with this optical stuff that they're doing these, these extreme advances that they've made mm -hmm. uh, tell us what you think about this i mean does this relate to uh, Marduk? And oh, yes. Okay. Uh, just to kind of fill in for your listeners what you're referring to, um, you had emailed me yeah. some articles mm -hmm. about advances that were being studied at Cornell and, and Duke and so on concerning the use of nanotechnology to alter the refractive and reflective properties of, of molecules and crystals and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, now to make the connection to Marduk here for a moment. In the Giza Death Star destroyed, and then uh, again in Cosmic War, I refer to the fact that the Enuma Elish refers to Marduk being given a suit, a cloak, mm -hmm. by the other gods, which if he spoke certain words made him invisible, and if he spoke certain other words, he reappeared. Okay. Yeah. Now... If you if you go way back to the Giza Death Star, uh, and I'm 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 so glad you raised this issue because it illustrates not only what I'm doing in the books but how I'm doing it. Yes. And I've said many times before that sometimes I intentionally scatter things and leave people to make the connections themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the Giza Death Star destroyed, I referred in I think the second chapter to the Mitchell Hedges, or first chapter, to the Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull, okay? And if you'll recall, one of the things that I mentioned there was that this quartz skull is unique in that it has interior optical channels in the quartz. Yeah. And that it has been carved and polished against the grain. And that there is no currently existing lapidary skill that would allow us to produce such an object. However, if you'll also recall, I proposed the idea that this crystal may have been grown, literally, by use of nanotechnology. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you'll also remember, I did something else in the Giza Death Star. Way toward the end of the book, when I'm talking about the actual uh, crystals that I believe to have been involved in the weapon, I talk about something that I called phi crystals, okay? Mm -hmm. And I speculated that these may have been a crystal with a such a peculiarly refractive index, perhaps even liquid crystal, that they literally appeared black, or to a certain extent, invisible. Okay? Yeah. They were black crystals. Because light was sort of trapped inside them like a superconductor. Yeah. Okay? Now, the connection I'm making there in the book is to the use of nanotechnology and crystals to grow special types of materials with refractive indexes that trap light or bend it in such a way that it does not reflect back onto the observer, okay? Mm -hmm. This is exactly the technology that is being described in the articles you sent me. This is exactly what they are trying to do. And I point out the, the salient fact that I wrote the Giza Death Star in the year 2000. Actually, I wrote it in 1998, but mm -hmm. that's beside the point. The book came out in the year 2000. We are now being told about this technology in the year 2008. Yeah. Okay? 
So in other words, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tooting my own horn, but for a purpose, <laughs> because what I'm what I'm getting at here is once you start down the path of the reconstruction of this physics from first principles and from the ancient texts, it is fairly easy to see when you compare it to modern developments that this is what they're up to. Yeah. This is what they're trying to do. So, you know, even though you're, the articles you sent me make no mention whatsoever of any of these ancient esoteric traditions, right. the fact is I have a book out in print eight years ahead of the fact that states that this is exactly the kind of technology that you see being described in those ancient texts. Wow. So, in other words, uh, in a certain sense, these articles vindicate, finally, with now real hard experimental data what I predicted about certain properties of the crystals that I believe to have been used in the Great Pyramid and uh, you know I, I, I feel vindicated to be quite honest well <laughs> you deserve to be vindicated because, oh my gosh the work and the research you've put in is phenomenal Joseph just oh my goodness well, with these, um, well, you know, NASA uh, here several years ago, there was a little mention in a news story mm -hmm. about them uh, growing crystals in space. Yes, 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 yes. And and we've talked about that before, but let's refresh everybody's memory. Okay. Uh, I, <clears throat> pardon me, I mentioned, I think it was like in the fifth or sixth session, that if you look at the Great Pyramid, you have a crystal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's made out of crystalline uh, bearing stone, and it is in the shape of a crystal at exactly the degree of inclination, 51 degrees, 51 minutes, so many odd seconds, of the natural slope of quartz. If you take a quartz hexagon and look at the top of it, that's about 51 degrees. Ain't that coincidental? <laughs> wow. So in other words, these engineers way back then were, were tailoring that structure to the nth degree, okay? But more importantly, I suggested that if you look at any naturally grown crystal on Earth, it has various kinds of defects in the lattice structures, uh, screw defects and, and displacement defects and so on and so forth. Yeah. And if you look in uh, the Giza Death Star Destroyed, there's a footnote in there, I don't remember what page it's on, where I describe the, the equations that are used to describe the amount of energy that's needed to produce those defects, okay? And a defect or a displacement in a lattice structure is simply a, a node or a lattice that's not there, okay? Or it's, it's been twisted to another position. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Great Pyramid then as a crystal, and I think you'll recall that I mentioned this, the internal empty chambers, I believe, to have been deliberately engineered to be where they are as engineered lattice displacements in the overall crystalline structure. Okay. okay. And that if you then tie this to the whole idea of, of a kind of a hyperdimensional physics based on the idea of space-time having little cells or compartments, a lattice structure, mm -hmm. that the pyramid is a reflection of the lattice structure of local space-time. Thus, if you grow a quartz on Earth, a crystal is a natural resonator <clears throat> of those torsion effects, of those screw displacements, those rotating displacements in the lattice structure of a crystal. In other words, they respond naturally to displacements in space-time as they're being grown. Okay, mm -hmm. So it stands to reason that the more you remove the influence of that local celestial geometry, such as putting it into zero gravity, okay. then you're going to be growing a different kind of crystal with many fewer types of those kinds of defects. Because the crystal, again, is responding naturally to the lattice structure of local space-time. So what they're doing up there when they're growing these crystals, in my opinion, is, you know, based on all of these reasonings, is, in my opinion, they are growing them to find out what that lattice structure actually is by experimental observation. Yeah. 
-hmm. by virtue of comparison to similar crystals grown under natural circumstances in Earth gravity. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> you put all this together, and I think you'll recall a long time ago I predicted that once we get sufficiently advanced with experimental data and so on in this physics, when we go back and examine the Great Pyramid, we're going to discover if we view it as a lattice structure, if we do the tensor analysis of the overall structure, and I'm not saying that's going to be easy, but right. <laughs> certainly not, but, but if we do that, we're going to discover that these internal chambers in the Great Pyramid are precisely placed along those principles of physics. They're designed to oscillate that lattice structure. Well, okay, lattice structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how how do we understand that? How do we perceive that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just a lay person. Well, let's let's go back. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because I can kind of get into a little bit of of what's in the philosopher's stone, okay. which is is uh, one of those new books that's in press now. Oh. <laughs> um, one of the things that Einstein did in general relativity and, and special relativity, and even to a certain extent in, in his uh, unified field theory papers, was that he viewed <coughs> space-time as a continuum. Now, a continuum is just a fancy word for something that is infinitely divisible into ever smaller units. Yes. You know, it's like uh, the number line. You know, when you used to be a kid and you had to go up and graph number lines on the blackboard, and then your teacher would put up fractions so that you could see what a fraction was, and you could make the fractions ever smaller and smaller and smaller, and there was no limit to how small or how big you could go, right? Yeah. Well, that's a mathematical continuum, and thus, when a physicist employs the term space-time continuum, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this smooth infinitely multipliable or infinitely divisible structure of space-time, mm -hmm. okay? But here's the big whopper. <clears throat> Quantum mechanics came along and showed by overwhelming empirical data as well as by some pretty abstruse theoretical mathematical reasoning that nature does not work in a continuum, it works in steps, it works in quanta, in discrete little quantities, okay? That's what quantum mechanics really is. That's what Planck's constant, which is the fundamental constant of quantum mechanics is, is it is the smallest possible observable unit of action, okay? So when we say that nature works in quanta, the implication is, and no one really got this until a German physicist came along in the early 1950s, and we'll get into him a bit in a minute, okay. came along in the 1950s and said, well, duh, this is what's been wrong with trying to put quantum mechanics and relativity together. Because space-time itself must, therefore, be quantized. It must exist in little teeny tiny cells of smallest possible units of measure. It isn't a continuum. And he went even further. He said that everything that we observe is in a state of rotation. And everything that's in rotation is within a bigger system that's also rotating within a bigger system that's also rotating. So guess what he's talking about? He's talking about dynamic torsion. Okay. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Okay. Dynamic torsion. <laughs> Refresh people on that. On torsion. Yeah. Well, torsion is uh, the concept itself is easy. The mathematics really isn't. But in mathematics, torsion is a particular kind of tensor in, in the tensor calculus that is used to describe the concept of the spiraling and folding and pleating of space. So yeah. the analogy I always use is if you want to picture what torsion does to space-time, take a soda can and, you know, either drink the pop or empty it out and then wring it like a dish rag. Yeah. When you do so, that can is going to spiral. The ends of the can draw closer together, and there's going to be crinkles and folds and pleats in the surface of the can. Okay? Yes. That's exactly what torsion does to space-time. Exactly. So 
when this physicist comes along and he says, well, space-time itself is quantized, he has made one big, huge break with the way most physicists subconsciously understand space-time itself because he said that there is a smallest possible cell or unit of that fabric. In other words, he's proposing that it has a lattice structure. Yeah. Okay? And what torsion does is exactly what it does when you're growing a crystal. It will introduce little defects, little displacements of those little nodes or lattices uh, in this structure and move them around. So it's, this physicist's name, by the way, he's almost totally unknown outside of Europe. He's a German fellow by the name of Burkhardt Heim. And he was totally blind, almost completely deaf, and had lost both of his hands. He'd lost his sight, hearing, and, and hands during a wartime accident doing research for, for the Third Reich. And no one knows exactly what research he was doing. I get into a bit of that in, in the new book that's coming out. But uh, his whole reason, and here, you know, here's the whopper, George Hannon, and I hope everybody's kind of sitting down for this one. Oh. <laughs> it just gets better and better. It gets George. better and better, yes. <laughs> well, actually, there's several whoppers, so, you know, fill up that coffee cup and, and get your cigarettes ready because here we go. <laughs> okay. And your notebooks. <laughs> yeah, and your notebooks, right. And, and make sure you buy the new book because it's in, it's in glittering detail there. I'm just kind of giving the Cliff Notes version. Okay. But Burkhardt Heim never published this theory in English for one reason only. He wanted it to remain in Germany. He did not want it to get outside of, of Europe and more particularly outside of Germany. But the reason he formulated his theory, it's called Heim theory, and it's a very interesting theory. It's a, it's a hyperdimensional theory. It works in six or eight or ten dimensions. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about it is from first principles. I mean, here's a guy that can't even write down his equations. He has to teach his wife higher mathematics just so that she can write them down. Hold on just a moment, uh -huh. Joseph. Sorry for that little break there. Okay, Joseph, we left off. With Burkhardt Heim. Yes. Yes, and everybody's sitting down. They've got their coffee. They've got their cigarettes, and here we go. One of the things that Heim and his theory did was he was able to predict from first principles, in other words, simply by working out his theory in detail, from first principles, some of the masses of the elementary particles. Now this is a, you know, in terms of physics, this is a truly breathtaking achievement. And some of these predictions have been uh, relatively well verified recently in Germany. But the really interesting thing about Heim, the whole reason he formulated his theory, which he first presented in 1952 at a gathering of people that was sponsored by, hang on, Messerschmitt Belko Blom. I hope that name sounds a little familiar. Was that he believed that in order for mankind to have any sort of permanent presence in space, that we had to have an entirely new physics and an entirely new technology based on it. The whole purpose from a practical standpoint of view for him developing his theory was to develop the means and, and predict the mechanisms whereby to predict and achieve anti-gravity. Okay? This was a truly... Uh, truly breathtaking thing for a scientist, particularly at that time, to come out and say. Now, the interesting thing is, when he published the first version of his theory, it was so overwhelmingly uh, subtle and closely argued that one of the major founders of, of quantum mechanics and, and himself a, a, an ardent supporter of the Nazi regime, a fellow by the name of Dr. Pascual Jordan, uh, the, the name is Spanish, but his parents had, in fact, emigrated back to Germany. So he was, he was in fact, himself a German. Yeah. Uh, contacted Heim and congratulated him on his theory. But more importantly, sometime, I've, I haven't been able to pin the exact date down, but sometime circa 1955 to 1960, 
none other than Dr. Werner von Braun contacted Burkhard Heim personally on a visit to, to uh, West Germany. Now, the reason that this is significant is, and I'm, I'm going to toot my, uh, my friend uh, Richard Hoagland's website here um, for a moment and, and refer your listeners to three new papers that he's posted up there. Okay. Okay? Uh, these, are, these are critically important papers, friends. Uh, I, I can't emphasize enough how important they are that you, when you finish listening to this interview, that you go to Mr. Hoagland's website, which is enterprisemission.com, and as the site comes up, you scroll down a bit, and you'll see two papers called Von Braun's 50-Year-Old Secret. And, you know, Mr. Hoagland being Mr. Hoagland, he has a bit of a sense of humor, so you have to kind of look carefully yeah. at one of the pictures he's posted for the header for this paper. But basically, he gets into an explanation of why it is our early moonshots were going so completely awry. And it goes, again, back to this very weird hyperdimensional torsion physics that uh, scientists, and including von Braun, quite self-evidently, discovered they were really running into when they were shooting things at the moon in the you know, late 50s and early 60s. So in other words, we have with this character Burkhardt Heim, we have a real unified field theory. This is not the kind of theory that Einstein, you know, that we've talked about before in connection to the Philadelphia experiment. This is not a theory that united merely electromagnetism and, and relativity and, and gravity. This is a theory that united not only those two things, but united them with quantum mechanics, did so from first principles and made, unlike, and this is the key point, unlike string theory, made testable, verifiable predictions, okay? Mm -hmm. So Heim, believe it or not, has become something of a quiet but very interesting figure to people in NASA and to people at Los Alamos and so on. Uh -huh. Because now that the details of his theory are getting out, courtesy of some of his associates over here in this country, they're saying, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but, you know, this raises the question of what was he doing for the Third Reich? And, you know, you, you, can, you can comb the literature. And Heim himself was very, very reluctant. He very seldom even mentioned that he'd ever done any work for the Third Reich. But he did. That's how he lost his sight and hearing and hands. Yeah. He, to the best of my knowledge, he was involved in some aspects of research that involved all this esoteric physics for the Third Reich. And the reason why I say that is that when he was a mere pup of 18, he went to none other than Werner Heisenberg, you know, during the early years of the war, yeah. and proposed to Heisenberg his nifty little idea for a quote unquote clean hydrogen bomb. Oh, gee. <laughs> you isn't know, that nice? Yeah, isn't that nice? <laughs> clean bomb. <laughs> a clean, a clean hydrogen bomb. Yeah. You know, oh, big bang gosh. and big bang and none of that nasty radioactive fallout stuff that you have from a conventional H bomb that requires an A bomb to set it off. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, oh my gosh. So, yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, you know, I, in the two new books, I, I, I detail why this work, why this interest in, in uh, clean hydrogen bombs, and I hint at it in SS Brotherhood of the Bell, but why this work in infusion and in plasmas is so directly tied to the physics of the bell. And uh, for, for your listeners that are interested, the Nazi International, which is the other book, will pursue that story with a vengeance. And I can tell you now that the book is finally in press. Oh. I can tell you now what I have not been, for these last few sessions, saying. I can pinpoint you to within 100 miles of a town in Argentina where the Vatican, so to speak, of the Nazi International was. It was within 100 miles of a little town in Rio Negro province, which is about oh, 900 some miles southwest of Buenos Aires. Yeah. Uh, the town is called San Carlos de Bariloche. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's more going on in San Carlos de Bariloche than meets the eye. 
if you if you look at the evidence that I, I present in Nazi International, the Nazis during the war had purchased some 10,000 square miles of Rio Negro province. Now, folks, that's an area of about the size of the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Okay? In other words, we're dealing with a large area. Yeah. They turned this into a compound, which to enter or exit, you had to have passes, military-style passes. It was guarded by Germans wearing sort of Africa-style, uh, Africa Corps-style uniforms. You, you mean know, like band uniforms? Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean like Field Marshal Rommel-style. Oh, those kinds. <laughs> those kinds, oh, yeah. Okay. I got you. Yeah, I like that. Uh, there is every evidence from the the documents of the Argentine uh, Intelligencia Central, okay, their, their central intelligence, that Martin Bormann was in this area in the 1950s, okay? So I go at great length into how did he and, and some of his cohorts get out of, of Nazi Germany at the end of the war, because, of course, the official story is that he killed himself. But more importantly, the local Argentines there that some of my contacts met, and I record all this in the new book, the local Argentines there were asked very directly, you know, that we've heard stories that Adolf Hitler was here. Yeah. And the young man who wasn't even alive at the time of the war, rather than saying, oh, he didn't know anything about that, or yeah, he's heard the stories, but he didn't know anything about that, yada, yada, yada. His response was, I'm sorry, I'm not permitted to talk about that. So, my friends, the, the, the untold story of World War II and its aftermath is in Argentina. Now, there is, there is one final clue that I'll leak out here about the new book. In fact, it's in, in, both, uh, it's in both the Philosopher's Stone and the Nazi International. Okay. In the Philosopher's Stone, I finally found and, and show the document that indicates beyond question that the Germans not only were working on lasers, because the exact physics principle is described in this document. Yeah. I post it and I translate it. They not only were working on them, but they were working on second and third generation tunable lasers. And I hope your listeners will appreciate what the significance of that is. Explain. Ah, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> Oh, a dial, uh, with a little dial on it or something? Well, yes, a tunable laser is a, is, a, is a laser that the lasing cavity is actually a gas, okay? Yeah. And depending on the gas you use, it will be resonant to different uh, isotopes, okay, of radioactivity, radioactive isotopes. So in other words, a tunable laser is the method of choice. If you really want to refine and separate and enrich isotopes that uh, are greatly pure, okay, mm -hmm. and do so with a great deal of efficiency. It is the most efficient means of isotope separation that there is, okay. It's very technologically complicated, but once you know the resonant frequency of the isotope and bombard it with light, of course, you, you have a perfect means of... of taking all the impure stuff that you don't want out of it. Yeah. Okay, it is, it is a breathtaking tool of isotope separation. Now, the reason I mention all this is if you go way back to Reich of the Black Sun, I mentioned the IG Farben so-called synthetic rubber plant at Auschwitz, yeah. okay, which I believe to have been an isotope separation facility, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you'll recall... From that book, I mentioned the fact that IG Farben experienced numerous breakdowns during the operation of that plant when it was in operation for those four years. Now, Farben, for people that don't know, they, they probably do know that it was this gymungously huge German chemicals cartel that, that grew up before the war. And in fact, I even mentioned that in, in, the, in the Nazi International. Do you know, George Ann, that... IG Farben was in liquidation for 51 years. 
Oh. That it was only finally oh. legally liquidated in the year 2003. Oh, my God, <laughs> You're kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> Oh my God. No, I'm not, because you know it made it made the little uh, article headliners in the Financial Times and so on. That if you really weren't paying attention, you'd never notice. You oh know, but my God. say what? I, Chief Farben is still around. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, the, the reason it took so long was this chemical cartel was so enormous that it had yeah. so many licensing agreements and and cartel agreements with other companies around the world that sorting out that mess was just, you know, a legal nightmare. Oh, you know, not to mention the, the Holocaust victims' claims against the company, you know, it was just, it was just yeah. a nightmare. So anyway, <clears throat> Farben, in, in setting up this separation plan at Auschwitz, I believe, you know, used different technologies there, the ones that that were proven, you know, the centrifuges and the cyclotrons and so forth, which, you know, given the technology of the day, they would have experienced some breakdowns, but it would have been, by the same token, relatively fixable, okay? Yeah. Yeah. But Farben's track record of technological accomplishment is rather at odds with the numerous difficulties and breakdowns at this plant. And I surmise now, having found this documentation, that the reason that they were experiencing so many difficulties were they were dealing with a real early World War II version of these tunable gas dynamic lasers that they were using for isotope separation. And, of course, at that period in history, you, you've got to find the right chemical gas with the right wavelength, it has to be, you know, a few angstroms wide, no, no wider, you know, if you're going to separate isotope with this method successfully. So you've got to do trial after trial after trial of just the right chemical gas. And what was Far Farben's specialty? Chemicals, gases, yes. dyes. Yeah, yeah. Murder. Murder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that. You know. Oh, my gosh. So now there's one more thing. One more thing to sense this case. If you go way back to Reich of the Black Sun and SS Brotherhood of the Bell, when I talk about the Farm Hall transcripts, remember that? Yes. It's the transcripts of the German nuclear scientists that were interred in Britain and their conversations were secretly recorded. Yeah. Now, remember that... In one of those conversations, the, the German physicist Wirtz says, well, it's very easy. What you do if you want to separate isotopes is you irradiate it with a particular wavelength. Oh. Remember that? Yeah, wavelength. Yeah. Wavelength. Yes. There, yes. There's your light. There's yeah. your laser. Yeah. And then what happens to the rest of the scientists? They all start talking at the same time, like they're trying to drown him out. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Okay. Then a little later on, the conversation picks back up again. And Hartek is, uh, pardon me, Heisenberg is saying that, well, you know, if they're going to use mass spectrometers or gaseous diffusion, meaning the allies, mm -hmm. then, you know, they're going to have to use lots of them, and they're going to have to have, oh, what, you know, 10,000 people to do this. Yeah. And, you know, he complains, well, we never had anything like that. Yeah. Okay, remember that little part of the conversation? Yes. Okay. But then what does Paul Hartek say? Immediately after Heisenberg gets done making his statement, Hartek chimes in with this whopper. He says, you only need ten men for that. I was amazed at what I saw at IG. Oh, good grief. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. So here's the thing that I put in the Philosopher's Stone. I go into this case for, for laser isotope uh, enrichment technologies being one of these technologies. Mm -hmm. I go back over those farm hall transcripts. I produce this document uh, and then translate it. But I also show a picture of a modern laser uh, isotope separation facility out in California. And you see this big empty room with this big long tube, you know, which is the, the lasing cavity for the, the gas of, of the laser. And you see two technicians, two, yeah. two, not thousands, two, two. two. 
So, you know, all of the circumstantial evidence, plus this, this German document from 1943, incidentally. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, to, uh, Luftwaffe, a, a field marshal, coming for a briefing, and this, this is just a little mem memorandum that this scientist had drawn up of talking points that he's going to go over with this field marshal. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, my gosh. But from 1943, can you imagine this? And, and it's clear from reading the document, George Ann, that what they're doing is they're moving beyond, you know, they've done their proof of concept experiments. Now they're getting ready to scale it up. Oh, my gosh, yes. Oh, gee. You know, so, you know, happy this day. is happy oh, days. <laughs> happy days. Oh. So here's what I think goes on, you know, to, to kind of go back over all of what we've discussed before and now add in this new stuff. Yeah. We know that they have this enclave in Argentina. Yeah. It's being guarded by Germans. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Naturally. <laughs> I mean, nowhere. What is it, Joseph, about <laughs> Germans? What is it? I mean, there's Well, as, as a college girlfriend of mine put it to me, they're scrappy people. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, but it seems like they're involved in every demonic kind of thing. <laughs> oh, gee, well, I, I don't think this is the Germans. I mean, remember, uh, we're dealing with Nazis here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah. They're sort of a, a, a you know, a, a transnational group of, of malcontents. Uh, yeah. You know, you've got Italian fascists and Belgian rexists and, and well, I didn't mean the Vichy German... collaborationists. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't mean the German people per se. I just meant that. The, some of the science that's come out of there oh, yeah, and yeah. the medical stuff that's right. come out is just... It's well, you know, this is a good question, and it goes back, I think, to to what goes on in Germany uh, in the 19th century. And, of course, you really mm -hmm. can't say Germany until 1871 because yeah. there isn't one. <laughs> there isn't yeah. a Germany that's just a big region on the map, really. Yeah. But uh, in the 19th century, the Germans are... Uh, for one thing, they are some of the world's top Assyriologists and Sumerologists and Egyptologists, and they have a philosophical tradition beginning with Kant that that very clearly makes space-time itself an artifact of, of conscious thought. In other words, there is a certain degree of subjectivity to it. Right. And that, of course, ties directly to what happens in German physics with quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. So you have this long philosophical tradition of, of a kind of nonlinear thinking going on in Germany that just isn't the same sort of stuff that, that right. you find in France and England. And, you know, then the second uh, component, I think, that, that makes Germany a uh, powerhouse for these kinds of ideas and, and uh, technological developments and so on is the fact that when the German Empire is formed at the end of the Franco-Prussian War, the House of Hohenzollern, which had before been a heavy patron of, of the arts and sciences, mm -hmm. really kind of kicks things into high gear because, of course, you have the founding of, of the Prussian Academy of Sciences and, and uh, you know, out of this will spin the Max Planck Institute and, and so on and so forth, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physics and mm -hmm. And all of this research is, is heavily sponsored and, and mentored, really, at, at the highest level by the, by the imperial crown itself. So you've got that climate. And in that climate, you are, you know, you're expected to kind of brainstorm. Yeah. And the third component that, you know, has played such a big role in, in history, you know, and <laughs> right up to recently, yeah. is this uh, German cartel system, you know, these, these gigantic corporations that uh, go out of their way to, to research some of these technologies and patent them. And what they will do, if you look at the pattern of, of uh, what the Germans were doing in the 19th and early 20th centuries with these corporations, they would take these patents, they'd file international patents in various countries, and then use those patents to broker or barter for technology that they did not have yeah. and then produce it under license in Germany. And that's kind of a story I get into in, in the Nazi International as well because one of the one of the real just to me to me mind boggling things about I. G. Farben mm -hmm. was first of all it was the brainchild of Wall Street. Okay? Yeah. 
So, you know, let's not forget the American the American participants in setting up that monster. But once they set it up, here's what happens. The Germans are not about to roll over and forego their sense of, of cultural identity and pride in their nation. They're, they're not going along with this early interwar New World Order scheme. Yeah. Because one of those schemes was the Young Plan, which, you know, quite literally would have mortgaged all of Germany to Wall Street. And this is the real reason, incidentally, that Fritz Thiessen backs the Nazis, because in his memoirs he writes the fact that, well, you know, I perceive the Young Plan as nothing but, but the loss of German national identity, culture, and sovereignty. Huh, you know. So along comes IG Farben. They set up this enormous cartel. Well, the first thing that Farben does is it starts not to play ball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because what they do is they set up all these cartel and licensing agreements, largely with Standard Oil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So what do they get? They get Standard Oil's technique for producing synthetic rubber. Yeah. Or, pardon me, for producing synthetic gasoline and oil and in return give to Standard and other American companies the Farben license on producing synthetic rubber, okay? Yeah, yeah. But. I knew synthetic <laughs> rubber was in there somewhere. Yeah, synthetic rubber is in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but here's, here's the problem. During World War II, I mean, this is after the United States has entered the war, Farben is so powerful that they prevent any American company from ever using their license to produce synthetic rubber. Oh, my God. So, you know. You're this, kidding. No, I'm not. Oh, my gosh. So yes. this, is, you know, this is kind of a one-sided arrangement here. No, really. We've given the technology to Nazi Germany to produce all this synthetic oil and synthetic explosives and everything else. And what do we get in return for it? Condoms. <laughs> yeah, condoms. <laughs> Zilch. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. You know, oh could have been more aptly put. <laughs> well, you know, I mention all this, George Ann, because it's really it's really crucial to understand this this uh this international cartel. Because Farben was international. I mean, in my word, it was spread all over the world, yeah. ninety countries, you know, and, and just hundreds of, of these little corporate subsidiaries. Oh but here's the thing. It's an international company around a solidly German core. Yeah. So now let's go to 1944. Uh-oh. On August 10, 1944, a meeting takes place at the Hotel Maison Rouge in Strasbourg, France, which, of course, is right across the border, right across the river from Germany. Mm-hmm. And the meeting is under the sponsorship of none other than Reichsleiter Martin Bormann, who's not there personally, but he sends his representative. And as his party representative, he chairs, uh, his name is Dr. Scheidt, and he chairs a meeting of large German corporate representatives. Okay? And I reproduce this in the book, but I'm going to kind of summarize the salient features. Dr. Scheidt informs the corporations that the war is lost. Yeah. But <laughs> we're going to keep fighting until certain objectives are met. So in other words, just stop and ponder that one for a moment. As far as Martin Bormann is concerned... Germany is going to keep fighting until the very moment that he has put all of his ducks in place. Yeah. Okay, and what are the ducks that he wants to put in place? Well, he says, first of all, this this representative of his informs big corporations like Krupp oh, <laughs> you know, that the first thing you're going to do is you're turning over to the party all of your foreign cash reserves. Oh, my God. Now, stop and think of this now for a oh, moment. Oh, yeah, I am thinking of this. <laughs> Let, yes. oh, 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 I'm serious. Let's just stop and take Krupp, okay? Yeah. Everybody knows who Krupp is. He's the guy that makes those big, god-awful German cannon, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay? And the tanks, and, you know? So, uh, who's Krupp? Well, Alfred Krupp, Gustav Krupp, buys a license 
in the Swedish Bofors Armaments Works. Well, who's Bofors? Bofors is the armaments company that allowed the Allies, namely the United States, to produce those quadruple barrel 40 millimeter anti aircraft guns that were on all of our ships shooting down Japanese planes in the Pacific. Oh my goodness. So, who's making money from it? Gustav Krupp. So this is quite a this is quite a considerable little cash uh, foreign cash reserve you have coming just from Krupp, <laughs> okay? Oh Not to mention these other German corporations there. So Bormann's representative shows up at this meeting and tells them we're basically confiscating it. And you know, in typical Bormann fashion, the, the threat was if you don't do this, we'll kill you. Oh, gee. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know that's right to the point. <laughs> right. And then the, in return, this, this representative goes on to say, and in return, the party will finance you after the war. And we will own you. And we will own you. Yes. But here's a real, here's a real curveball. In addition to this, Dr. Scheidt says, what we'd like you to do, strong suggestion there, is we want you to set up research bureaus not directly connected to your company, not visibly traceable to it, and certainly not traceable to the party, wherever you have operations. And we want you basically to spy, steal technology, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> and... <laughs> and? Yeah, well, that and is a... Yeah. Yeah, that and is a whopper. Yeah. We are going to have liaisons to your companies in these bureaus. In other words, spies. Right. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, at all of these little detailed managerial research, notice this point, research levels, yeah. the Nazi party is positioning itself to play a significant role in the post-war economic resurgence of Europe. Oh. And we'll go a little further. Yes. Recall that in the SS Brotherhood of the Bell, I mentioned that Martin Bormann, cynical pragmatist that he was, mm -hmm. only joined one esoteric society in his life. Yeah. Okay. But he bought a home. Guess where he bought it? Where? Ingolstadt. <laughs> you know what Ingolstadt is? You know, I've been all over Germany in and the past, you, but I don't, I can't. Okay. Ingolstadt was the place where... Adam Weishaupt founded oh, yes. the Bavarian Illuminati. Illuminati. Yes, okay. yes, yes. All right, so here's Martin Bormann, <laughs> you know, kind of chairing this meeting from afar in Berlin. Yeah. Okay? And then the other part of this plan that they, they concoct is, is that they are going to move as much of their technical blueprints, patents, and staff overseas as they can. Uh -huh. So you have this enormous operation that's, you know, by that time already underway. He's just kind of making it official and serving notice on the corporations that this is what we're going to do and here's how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. By the end of the war, he has set up some 750 dummy corporations. Oh, wow. <laughs> 750. In 50, right. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. So, you know, put this all in now into the context of the scenarios that I've outlined in the previous books. First of all, we have that mad dash of General Patton into Czechoslovakia. Yeah. What does he find there? He finds a lot of strange goings on connected with a German general named Kammler. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have the surrender of the U-boat, U-234, if you'll recall, which surrendered all of that enriched uranium and infrared proximity fuses, not to Canada, which encountered the U-boat first, but to the United States. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right? So, in other words, we have the Nazis divvying up A-bomb components between the United States and the Soviet Union. We have the Nazis divvying up rocket components and scientists between the United States and the Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, 
Joseph. Oh, good grief. Yeah, it's, it's, this is a whopper, folks. I, I grant you that. So, you know, please buy the books because if you just listen to what I'm telling you now, you'll think I'm a nut. You know, but I, I do try and document this, you know, as you know, very carefully. Uh, but, you know, what do they keep to themselves? The bell. Uh-huh. And I can now tell you that in the Nazi International, I, I make the case that at least some components of that experiment and of that project and of that physics, beyond any shadow of a doubt, went to Argentina because I have a picture yeah. <laughs> from Argentina. Uh, a question. In that area of Argentina, uh -huh. per chance, is that a grape-growing region, vineyard? <coughs> there are some there, yes. But... Yeah, why am I not surprised? Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, <geez>. oh, Joseph. <laughs> And it's just a hop and a skip and a jump from Colonia Dignidad. <laughs> you know, yeah, again. All the other wonderful people that are down there. Yeah, that snatched God knows how many kids. Mm -hmm. Oh, for research. Oh, gee. Now, how did some of these Nazis get there? I have to go into this little part of the story because you're going to love it. <laughs> I just know you're going to love this. I'm glued here. Go ahead. <laughs> you, you remember that lovely man, Juan Domingo Perón. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You and know, little Eva. And little Evita. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Such a charming couple. Oh, gosh. Oh. Well, Perón, of course, you know, as everyone knows, it was, was quite a Nazi fanatic. I mean, he just he just thought it was the best thing to come along since sliced strudel. But um, yeah. Perón, most people are unaware, declares war against Nazi Germany in March of 1945. Now, I was born that year, you know. There was a lot going on. <laughs> there was a lot going on in 1945. You're yeah. not kidding. And it's still with us, folks. That's the bad news. That is the bad news. Yeah, that oh is the bad gosh. news. Oh, All right. Sure. Perón, Perón declares <laughs> war on Nazi Germany in 1945. And, you know, as a kid, I used to think, well, gee, that's weird. You know, what are they going to do? Yeah. <laughs> The war's all but over in Argentina, you know, it's 10,000 miles south of there. You know? Yeah. So what exactly do they think they're doing? Well, here's what. And it's, it's and I even quote Perón on this, although I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing what he says. His whole reason for doing that, he says, is that Argentina could then legally enter Germany oh. with its planes and ships. And <laughs> pick up Germans, German things, yeah. <laughs> and as an ally of the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, <laughs> spirit them right out of there. <laughs> How slick is that? It's very slick. I oh. mean, you know, leave it to a South American dictator to come up with that. <laughs> that is slicker than slick. Uh, that is slicker than slick, you know. Oh my. So I can, you know, can you just imagine Martin Borman sitting there in the bunker in Berlin receiving the news of the Argentine declaration of war? He's probably skipping for joy. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yes. You know, and it, you have to hand it to old Perón because you know the Allies had been pressuring Argentina to enter the war on their side for yeah. years. Yeah. So when he finally does, it's just. You know, it's kind of in your face. <laughs> in your face and, and scam, scam, scam. Yeah, yeah. And scam, 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 you know. So you have a bunch of Nazis flying to Argentina in these Argentine civil airliners, you yeah. know, being served cocktails. <laughs> yeah, and it's right out in the open. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, it's... If it if it weren't true, you know, you'd have to think that this is a this is a really bad Hollywood B movie. No fooling! Oh my gosh, Joseph! I, yeah, if 
<laughs> if it weren't true, you you just wouldn't. How could you believe it? I mean, yeah, I know. It's, it's, it'd be it's, science fiction. You know, you, you read all this, yeah. or rather, don't read it in our sanitized history books. Right. And when you do read it, your jaw just you know is all the time. You know, you, your mouth is always open, and <laughs> it's just it's just overwhelming. Well, you have to reread it to be sure that that's what you read. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Oh, Joseph. Yeah, and you know, uh, there's there's another little part of this story I'm not uh, deliberately not going into here because it's it's the uh, it's the real clincher on all. Well, I can go into a little bit of it. Okay. Uh, in 1951, Perone holds a press conference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he announces to the world. That Argentina has successfully discovered the secret of the hydrogen bomb. Oh, gee. Now, you know, this is a year before we detonate the first one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the, the reporters are all a little dumbfounded. And uh, Perón turns it over to an Austrian, sci- uh, get that now, Austrian scientist by the name of Dr. Ronald Richter. Oh, boy. <laughs> who proceeds to tell the world, yes, he has found a way to control, listen carefully, to control thermonuclear processes. Oh, boy. Oh, oh boy, yeah. Now, what happens next in this is, and, and incidentally, this is a secret project that Perón had been sponsoring since 19, I think it was 48. In other words, you have all these Nazis down there around San Carlos de Bariloche, and that's where Richter's project was based, yeah. okay, tinkering around with fusion, yeah. with plasmids, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, I have a picture in the new book of uh, some of my friends that were kind enough to let me use the picture of them standing on the ruins of one of Richter's old laboratories close to San Carlos de Bariloche. Yeah. And guess what they're standing next to? What? I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> Large metal drums. Uh oh. Does that sound like the bell? Oh my. What was on the inside of the bell? Yeah. Two counter rotating drums. Large metal drums. Ah. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> oh, Joseph. Oh my gosh. What? Splendid research you've done. It's it's yeah it's you know oh. these these two books the the philosopher's stone and and uh, the Nazi International are uh, you know the story's not over yet if you thought it was right. with the SS Brotherhood uh uh-uh. uh <laughs> no well, you know it's so interesting <coughs> about this business of uh, Argentina and Brazil and all that and, and Egypt and, yeah and well <laughs> well right now Argentina and Brazil right because only it just seems to me that all this stuff with the Nazis down there mm-hmm. it's still going on. Oh, Look sure. at all the genetically modified produce that's coming oh, yeah, out of there sure. and genetically modified God knows what. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, what is it with these people and this kind of bent that they have? Uh, I was going to say spiritually, but I take that back. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> You know, what is it? I mean, they they want to... Joseph, surely this stuff was going on before the flood. It's oh, sure, yeah. I mean, we're told it was. In oh. in so many different texts and so many different yeah. traditions. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the Bible, the, the Sumerian texts, yeah. uh, the Egyptian texts, yeah. yeah. Okay. Remember Yasser Arafat? Oh, yes. <laughs> who would forget him? Okay. Do you know who his cousin was? No. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Oh, my goodness. Do you know who he is? No. Okay. Well, from 1940, well, in 1941, he's in Baghdad. Yeah. What's he doing in Baghdad? Well, he's helping the Germans overthrow the British puppet government there. Huh. When the British come in and, and clean up that situation, well, he decides that he better split for, for nicer climbs. Yeah. So he goes to Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> where he is appointed the uh, chief sort of Muslim chaplain to Muslim units that he's helped raise for the Waffen-SS. Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. Then as the war draws 
towards its close, the SS comes to him and offers him an airplane to spirit him to safety. Uh Now, that should tell you something about how highly valued he was as a contact. Yeah. Okay? And to be offering an airplane at that time of the war to someone like that would have undoubtedly required the authorization of, you guessed it, Martin Bormann. Okay? But he declines, and he makes his way back to Egypt, okay, Mm -hmm. where he and his cousin, Yasser Arafat, (laughs) (laughs) uh, befriend a young Egyptian colonel by the name of Gamal Abdel Nasser. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Remember him? Yes. So, well, let's recall how Nasser comes to power. The CIA... Well, why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> and then they murdered him. <laughs> well, hang on. Yeah. Hang on. Oh, let's, let's, just, <laughs> let's just slow down and look at the, the cast of characters real carefully here. Whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is all in the Nazi International, so, folks. It's uh, supposed to be out in two months, so call Adventures Unlimited and get your copies now because the full story is there. I'm just giving the Cliff Notes version. Anyway. Yeah. The CIA, uh, that's that would be Alan Dulles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember who his friend was? Yeah. Reinhard Galen, chief of German military intelligence. <laughs> Remember that little deal they struck? Oh, gosh. Oh, Joseph. <laughs> okay. Well, Alan Dulles and his brother, John Foster, who is President Eisenhower's uh, Secretary of State, decide that King Farouk, who incidentally really kind of liked the Nazis in spite of the fact that the British were his his supporters, yeah. they decide that he has to go. Oh, yeah. Okay, so they overthrow, the CIA overthrows uh, King Farouk. Mm-hmm. Well, who did they get to be the people on the ground, so to speak? Well, they turned to their dear old friend, General Galen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh. So who do they send down there to clean up all of this stuff? Well, one of them is Colonel Otto Scorzani, who was the SS colonel, if you remember, that rescued Mussolini, who married Hjalmar Schacht's daughter, who you'll recall, Hjalmar Schacht, he was that lovable man who was Hitler's Reichsbank president. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> Hang on, Georgia. Oh, what a box of snakes. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Take a long draft of coffee on this one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> they send Scorzani down there. They send down there General Otto Raymer. Now, yeah. who's Otto Raymer? Well, he's the German general that helped put down the coup attempt in Berlin in July of 1944 against Hitler. He's the one that kept the Nazis in power. So they send him down there. They send good old Hjalmar Schacht himself (laughs) to to help help the new Egyptian economy. And here's the real clincher. They send a fellow by the name of Dr. Wilhelm Fuss. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now that name, if you've been following my books, and if you've been following this presentation very carefully... He was the fellow who first broke the story to the West about Kamler's super-secret weapons think tank because he was the civilian liaison officer inside the Skoda Works in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. What's Dr. Voss doing in Egypt in 1955? Well, he's been sent there by none other than Chancellor Konrad Adenauer along with Otto Scorzani and Yelmar Schacht and General Raymer. Oh, my gosh. What do they do once they get there? Well, Scorzani becomes a very close friend of the Grand Mufti and his cousin Yasser Arafat and Kamal Abdel Nasser. So once Nasser overthrows the puppet president that had replaced Farouk, guess who he gets to train his army and intelligence? Well, he gets Otto Scorzani, Otto Remmer, another SS general by the name of Wilhelm Farnbacher. While in the meantime, Wilhelm Voss arranges all sorts of neat and tidy arms contracts between Egypt and West Germany to help Egypt start building missiles to hit you-know-who. 
Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, it's this is this just sounding ghastly by now? Oh. Now here's the real fun part. I'm not done. One of the people that goes to Nasser's Egypt is a fellow by the name of Johann von Lers, who was a fellow that was a, a senior uh, member of Dr. Goebbels' propaganda ministry and a Muslim convert. So the first thing he does when he gets to Egypt is he starts translating Mein Kampf into Arabic, oh, no. the Protocols of Zion into Arabic. Oh, this is where all those Arabic copies come from. Okay, the ones that Saddam Hussein liked to read. Okay? So, are you there? Hello? Hello? Yes. Okay, you're there. Yes. I thought I'd lost you. I didn't hear anything. No, that's okay. okay. <laughs> so, Johann von Lehrs, this is the fellow where all these modern-day Arabic copies ultimately stem from. So, Nasser, as we know, eventually kicks these Germans out and brings in the Soviets, okay? So you've got to say, well, there's, well, there may have been a Nazi connection there, but thank goodness the Soviets came in to rescue the situation, right? Yeah. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> because in the Soviet Union at the time, as the head of its foreign ministry's Arab desk, we have an ex-Nazi who. <laughs> <laughs> they're like fleas, man. Yes, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Oh, Who, incidentally, is a very good friend with Otto Scorsese and General Raymer. Oh, <laughs> so, you know, my oh. point being, friends, is that if you look at the post-war political machinations of these Nazis, oh yeah, you will find them not only inside of sensitive ministries inside the Soviet Union and the United States, mm -hmm. okay, but you will, if you look carefully, what they're doing is they are doing their utmost to exacerbate Cold War tension because this gives Germany maneuvering room. Uh -huh. And wherever you will find these Nazis in the third world, you will find their... Uh, sponsored dictators, Perón and, and Muammar Gaddafi and, and Gamal Abdel Nasser and, and people like this talking about the so-called third position. And if you recall, even the British fascist Oswald Mosley talked about that as a, a, a position somewhere between Western capitalism and Soviet communism, namely National Socialism. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in other words... <coughs> There is a pattern here that persists right up and including the German reunification itself, which plays east and west off against each other. And the real capstone in this story is the untold story about the German reunification itself. Most people don't even know or realize what happened. Oh, my gosh. That is just stunning. Mm -hmm. Joseph, just stunning. It, it's it's breathtaking. It's yeah. scary. Yeah, yeah. And you know, when you look at what's going on in our own country here today, mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, it, truly they are like fleas. They are everywhere. Oh yeah, oh, you know. Geez. The the oh. this is why I think you know if you look carefully at the symbols, um, and that's the reason I sent you that little link of 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 the modern German army on parade. Yeah. <laughs> you know? oh, the drums and all. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, and I predicted, you know, my friends, some of my friends that know me well know that I made this prediction back in the early 90s, shortly after the reunification. I told them, you watch. I said, you will slowly see the Bundeswehr, that's the modern German uh, defense establishment, slowly bring back all of those Prussian military traditions yeah. Like the bell tree, which you you know you saw what I sent you, the bell yeah. tree. They're they're clearly and proudly marching around with that thing, you know. Good grief! And they're going to bring all of this back. And sure enough, you know, and I can I can give you internet links to uh, torchlight German army parades out inside of the Reichstag in 2005 in Berlin, and mm -hmm. you know all of this wonderful Prussian stuff. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, all of this is symbolism of something that's going on at a much deeper level 
inside of, of Germany and inside of Europe because after the reunification, of course, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, you had literally a vacuum created in Eastern Europe, yeah. you know, and who was only too ready to be sucked into it economically. You know? yeah. <laughs> so uh, watch these things very carefully because they're, they're little indicators, in my opinion, that you have this uh, some modern descendant of this Nazi international at work. Oh, I think absolutely that's true. I mean, just look at the news in this country on a daily mm-hmm. basis. Joe. Well, yeah, not only are there increasing fascist uh, policies and, yes. and mores, if you want to call them that, yeah. uh, taking place, but, you know, t- the, the, the real signal event for me was, you know, the German reunification. Do you know when the German reunification occurred? I can't remember. The- on the anniversary of Kristallnacht. Oh, yes. And that, in turn, was also an anniversary of Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch in 1923 in Munich. Oh, my gosh. So, in other words, this event was carefully timed. The modern German unification was carefully timed. Well, you know, somebody just gave a speech over there. That yeah. And it's running for president. Yeah. It is very, the birth records are very, you know. Unclear. Yes. <laughs> Murky. To put it mildly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. And uh, it was very interesting where that speech was given. Oh, yes. And who is one of his advisors, you know, and yeah. uh, his big niece. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, the symbolism to me, some people that I know very well and respect, think that this symbolism are, are, is wonderful because they think it's a symbolism meant to show the final destruction of that old order. Oh. I think quite the reverse. I agree with you. Uh, the, the alarming thing to me, Jordan, is that you see, uh, well, let's go back to what we started with uh, this evening and this, this economic crisis. Yeah. Uh, as a result of the the idiots in the current regime mm-hmm. in Washington, we have pretty much alienated most of our allies, yeah. especially in Europe, mm-hmm. especially China, yeah. and you know Russia never an ally, but you know not terribly hostile either. Yeah. You know, for all of the Cold War, they didn't lob any missiles at us, you know, mm-hmm. so that ought to tell us something. But, you know, uh, the the world is turning so against this Anglo-American power elite. But my fear is, is that there's another elite in the wings that has its own fingers in these events. And uh, that there is now a real internal struggle. I agree with you, Joseph. I really do. Uh, There's just suggestions of it. There's just mm-hmm. uh, signs mm-hmm. of what you're talking about. Yes. Very definitely. Yes. And, you know, I'll be very blunt. I, I, I think uh, at least one of these factions that is is launching this assault on the, on the Anglo-American uh, faction of, of the New World Order is precisely this Nazi International. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, the the, the political center in Europe, uh, you know, with the collapse of the Soviet Union is, is once again very firmly in, in Berlin and Paris. And uh, uh, they're not going to play ball with us forever. I, I just don't see that in the works. We're going to try and coerce them to, and they may appear to be doing so for a time. Yeah. But uh, I just don't see it in the, in the long term at all. They'll gravitate more and more into Russia's orbit. So that would leave this country... Pretty much isolated. <laughs> well, you know, on one hand, that may not be bad. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's my thinking, too. Um, we certainly have done no better than any other empire that's ever been attempted. Right. Uh, and certainly, in, in many instances, have, have done much worse, uh, because we've certainly made a lot more people angry at us a lot faster oh, than, yes. than anybody else has previously. That's true. 
uh, even the British were, were quite this adept at it. So, oh. you know. <laughs> Lessons. Yeah, we could give lessons, you know. You think you know how to be perfidious, I'll be unwell. We'll show you. you know? yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's it's truly a breathtaking story. It's, uh, and, you know, even, i got to be honest, Georgia, and even as I finish this last book, I keep finding more stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so well, there may know, be yet another book in the works here. You I know, my know. gosh, Joseph, it's like a sweater. Yeah. And, you know, you find a loose piece of yarn and you start pulling on yeah. it, and it just keeps unraveling. Unraveling, yes. Yeah. So you have found a lot of loose ends. That, well, you know, the oh. story the story here, the central story, let's not lose sight of what it really is. The central story here is the bell. Yeah. The central story here is this uh, extraordinary device and, and the advanced physics that it represents. Mm -hmm. Because somehow in the midst of this Swirl and struggle for power in the world. There is also a struggle for who is going to end up controlling this technology. I think this is the real hidden story. Is that why they want to kill so many people on this planet? Well, good question. Let's let's take that as a hypothetical and grant the proposition for the sake of argument. Okay. Okay. I suspect right now that the problem is is they have not got things to the state that they need to be before they can start doing that. Okay. They still, so to speak, need everybody in order for them to pull off whatever it is that they want to pull off by doing that. Yeah. Okay. Now, believe it or not, I increasingly think, although it's going to sound terribly um, ludicrous to suggest this, I increasingly think that the reason they are doing this or whatever it is that they're preparing for is that some of them simply want to get off of this planet altogether. Oh, yeah. Oh, Joseph, I'm okay. glad you brought that up. Absolutely. You know, the old alternative three scenario. I think this is exactly what some of these idiots and, you know, in the so-called elite have in their otherwise concretized heads. Well, isn't that what they did before the flood? Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, they're, an they're good at doing it. I mean, their ancestors did. Yeah. yeah, right. So, you know, something like this I think is in their heads. But the problem is, is they haven't got things to the sufficient state of development for them to do that. They still need us. And in the midst of all this, you have some of these other factions saying, no, we've had enough, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rothschild. We're not playing your game anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the real source of the panic. And now the fight is on. I suspect, I have, and please understand me here, I have no evidence for this whatsoever. It is merely a... Uh, a speculation based on a deeply felt intuition, okay? Okay. That in the midst of all of these enormous derivatives yeah. that have, you know, 250 variables, you know, like like anyone can calculate that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> There's certain reasons why that cannot be done that any... Uh, college educated mathematician could tell you, you know? but anyway yeah. um, I suspect that somewhere in this mountain of derivatives is a technological thread mm -hmm. that what's really at stake here are not mortgages and things you know for, and I'm not trying to be little or or to put people that are suffering because of these things in in a uh, derisive or, or uh, minimizing light at all. That's not what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is is that somewhere deeply hidden within this mass of, of uh, and tapestry of uh, claims on ownership, there is a technological thread. Yeah. This is a struggle, in my opinion, for who is going to control that technology and pull off their faction's version of the scenario. 
that's what I think this is about. Yeah, but their scenario, uh, I think they want to follow the biblical script. You know? Some of them do. Okay. Uh, follow the biblical script as they've carefully set up people to believe is biblical. Yeah. It isn't biblical at all. You're right. That whole dispensationalist interpretation is not there in the first 1,000 years of Christian history. It does not exist. So let me be very clear on that. If you are of that camp, I'm sorry. You can call me a heretic. You can call me a, not a Bible believer or whatever you wish to call me. I'm sorry. My uh, standard of interpretation in such instances is you must document the course of performance and it must be there in the early history of the first 1,000 years of the church not after the Protestant Reformation created now to this day over 30,000 different flavors and blends of what biblical Christianity is I'm sorry Martin Luther you were wrong Amen I'm So glad was you the Pope Yes. So was the Pope, yes. but Martin Luther, John Calvin, Henry VIII, all the rest of you, you were wrong. Wow. And all of the churches that claim you as their founders, you are wrong. I agree. That includes the Baptists. Yep. So, you know, let me be very clear where I'm coming from on that score. Okay. But... Granted that some of these factions have a uh, false fulfillment scenario in mm -hmm. mind, mm -hmm. this can only work if you have already created a climate of theological opinion to pull it off. Yeah. In other words, you have deceived millions of people. Yes. And, and those being deceived don't know it. They may be acting in totally good and sincere faith. I am not impugning the hearts or minds of the people that hold those beliefs, merely challenging them, document it. Good point, Jim. Get your head out of Strong's, get your head out of the, the uh, annotations in your Ryrie study Bibles, go back and find that doctrine in St. Clement of Alexandria or St. Cyril of Jerusalem or any accepted church authority, and you will not find it. You won't even find it really in the, in the Gnostics. It's not there. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, you know, let me be very clear. Okay. So if that scenario is what some have in mind, others have in mind a different scenario. Okay. And it's all got to be accomplished by some technological means that they've kept very carefully hidden off the books, out of the prying eye. Yeah. But I think that part of this economic crisis is precisely over which of these factions is going to control it. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, That's gosh. again, I have no evidence for that. It's a gut instinct. Well, I think we share the same instinct there because uh, <laughs> they are they're they're moving at a very rapid oh, yes. pace. They are. Let's look. Let's look at that because I think you just you you just pointed out something that few people are noticing about this. If you look carefully at the statements of you know the Russians, uh, Medvedev and and uh, Putin and some of their advisors, or if you look at some of the noises that are coming out of China or Tokyo and so on, yeah, they are taking a very calm attitude to this. They're calling for considered responses. Yeah. They're calling for let's get down at the table and talk this over and see what we can do about it and restructure this whole si this whole system. Okay? They're calm. Which means they're not the ones really threatened ultimately by what's happening. Good point. The people that are panicking are the people in London and New York City. Uh huh. To a lesser extent, Paris, Berlin, and so on and so forth. They're panicking, but not quite as much. Okay. Okay. So this is what signals to me that there is some factional infighting going on, and that if there's panic in London and New York, this can only translate to my mind that 
the panic is genuine. This is not simply a staged event on their part. They're panicked by something, and someone else is pressuring them. Yeah. Okay? And this is why I suspect that the, the two biggest uh, factions that are challenging them come, number one, from, from the, the Russo Chinese Asian bloc, so to speak, mm-hmm. and the other from not so much the Europeans, but the people behind the European Union. And very clearly the historical precedent is there. That's Borman's Nazi International. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, you know, right. we're, 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 in a certain sense, we're kind of spectators on a, on a big uh, inside conspiratorial game that's being played out. Yeah. Definitely. No, I agree with that. <laughs> and what... Uh, you know, I mean, Joseph, what a time to be alive to witness all this. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like that old Chinese oh. curse. May you live in interesting times. <laughs> they oh, yeah. certainly are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and there's another p- facet to this. You know, they, they're they keeping the population um, in constant uh, upheaval, anxiety, uh, with the news stories that are coming out, oh, the, you know, it's going to be a famine. Right. You're not going to have food. You won't have any money. Right. Um, You'll have too much money. <laughs> yeah, but it won't be any good. It won't be any good. Yeah, yeah, the Chinese troops are going to come and take your house away from you because they own the mortgages. Right. I mean, you know, they keep people totally um, emotionally upset. Right. I think I think there's two reasons for that. There's the first and obvious one, that they want to keep people paralyzed. They want yeah. to keep people from acting. The biggest thing they're afraid of now is real action yeah. on the part of of the American people and, let's face it, the Canadians and the Mexicans and everybody else that they've, they've raped. Right. Okay? Right. And, and that includes most of Europe and Asia, too. <laughs> How about so, the whole world? Yeah, right? pretty much. Yeah, so pretty they, much is right. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, they've got a lot of people mad, and they have to keep this this shell game of smoke and mirrors going on. But the second thing that I think this suggests is they themselves, to a certain extent, are uncertain. They don't know. All of their models have broken down. Mm -hmm. They don't know themselves what's going to happen next, and therefore their strategic planning, (laughs) here's, here's the joy of it all, their strategic planning finally is breaking down. They cannot make any real economic or ge- geopolitical forecasting that has any validity, at least as far as their own survival and security is concerned. Uh-huh. This is why I think, again, they're panicked. Yeah. You know, this big Nief, you know, I, I just recently acquired a book of his uh, that <coughs> – has all of his confident uh, tones, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. But he's been curiously silent as all of this is going on. Uh, every now and then he, he'll pop up with a little article, but, you know, he kind of up periscope and dive, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> real fast. Yeah. I think um, I think that they, the, the uh, Anglo-American elite is going through some real rocky waters and uh, they're calling in as many favors as they can but they're running out of markers they they really are they have they have none left with russia yeah well they've made too many enemies they've made too many enemies <laughs> you know yeah. they have made too en- too many enemies they've gone for the brass wing- ring too quickly and now you know uh eurasia is, is making noises like they're not going to play ball anymore <laughs> and let's face it folks Russia and China is bad enough yeah. to, to have them uh, drawing closer and closer together. Oh, yeah. Uh, but you throw Europe into the mix, and uh, there's there's just no way economically, geopolitically, militarily, or in any other sense that matters, uh, can the United States stand up to that. This, 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 it just won't happen. Oh, Joseph, my goodness. What a journey. It's, yeah, it's 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 yeah. It's, this has been a little 
uh, blitzkrieg, you know, yeah. <laughs> since we're employing those metaphors. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times. We defeated the Nazis. Oh, give me a break. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned that. I don't know if I've mentioned this. What? I begin the Nazi International by looking at the Japanese and German surrenders. Yeah. In World War II. Mm -hmm. And I, I print the surrender documents. You can actually read what they say. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, here's a funny thing. <laughs> oh, not another one. Oh, Joseph. If you read the Japanese surrender... It very explicitly states that Minister, I forget what his name was, is surrendering on behalf of and for the Emperor, the Imperial Cabinet and Diet, and the Imperial General Staff. Yeah. Okay? There yeah. you have it. All right. <laughs> You've got all the significant people that need to be surrendering, surrendering. All right. <laughs> okay? Let's go to the German surrenders. <laughs> oh, this would be a good one. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Why are you not surprised? Oh, my gosh. Well, <laughs> in on May 7th, <laughs> poor Colonel General Yodel is hauled to Reims, France, where he sits down and signs the German instrument of surrender. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you read this carefully. General Yodel is surrendering for the German general staff and armed forces yeah. to the representative of the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force and the representative of the Supreme Headquarters of the, of the Red Army. Okay? Uh -huh. So you have one military surrendering to another military. Right. There's a little codicil in there that says, these surrender terms will be set aside by any general provisions of a German surrender to be negotiated at a later date. Something to that effect. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Then the Soviets kind of say, well, we didn't really have a high enough ranking member there. So we better do all this all over. So on May 8th, another surrender instrument is signed in Berlin. Present signing are Field Marshal Keitel and Admiral von Friedeberg and, and General Stumpf. I, I think I mentioned this in a previous session. And again, they're surrendering on behalf of the German military, and all the representatives of all the service branches of the German military are there, signing to all the representatives of all the Allied military forces, okay? Oh, my. But, once again, yeah. there is no representative signing on behalf, in either instance, of the Reich government, okay? Which, at that time, is Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz, okay? Okay. Okay. Now, here to me is what the big mystery is, George Ann. In neither case is any member of the Nazi party there. <laughs> the Allies could have certainly requested such a representative and certainly could have specified in the surrender instrument itself that the Nazi party, by signing the instrument of surrender, hereby abolishes itself and declares itself a criminal organization. You would think so. You would think that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of hard to find a representative of the Nazi party at that level from, of the party chancery itself when you've already kind of put out the story that said representative died fleeing Berlin. <laughs> yeah. But somehow you keep spotting him all over Europe uh -huh. and Latin America. Right. And... In other words, he can't be found to sign it. <laughs> and just for good measure, even though we think he really died here, or maybe it was there. Yeah, we don't really <laughs> we know. We don't really know. <laughs> yeah. Because after all, the people telling us that he died here, or maybe there, <laughs> yeah. oh, gosh, are all themselves Nazis. <laughs> right, right. Oh, my and they can't be believed. Except when they tell us that, yeah, Dolph really did off himself. Oh, my God. Oh. Yeah. Getting the picture? Clear as a bell. Clear as, yeah, clear as, not to coin a pun. <laughs> <laughs> 
not to coin the pun. <laughs> oh my gosh, Chuck. Yeah, it's you know it, it's just it's just bizarre. Now the real problem is, and may, this may be the case. I don't know because I haven't looked into it. But I have tried to find that subsequent general terms of surrender. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> and golly, you know. I just don't seem to be having much luck. <laughs> maybe it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe that that whole thing, you know, that whole twelve year period was just a figment of our imagination. <laughs> no fooling! Oh my goodness! Oh, <laughs> you know, unless you know, and I don't know because I haven't seen the terms of of any of the treaties that that the Western Allies signed with West Germany. Yeah. You know, maybe they, they put in a codicil in there that, uh, you know, this was uh, Germany surrenders and now we're giving Germany back to Germany or something to that effect, you know. But but I, I kind of doubt it. But, you know, if that's not in there, then, you know, where legally do we have a signature of a representative not of the German military, and I'm arguing, you know, little legal nitpicky points here, yeah. to be sure, yeah. but where legally do we have any signature of a representative of the Reich government, of the Third Reich, and that legally was Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz at the time and his cabinet? Uh-oh. You know, uh, I can't find it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, gosh, Joseph. <laughs> it ain't there. Huh. Huh. Well, you know, look at the Nuremberg trials. What a joke. Well, yes. And, yeah. you know, we haul a bunch of Germans off to these, these tribunals, Yeah. which in my opinion, you know, call me call me a, a Nazi sympathizer, which I'm certainly not, but call me one if you wish. The legality is dubious, to say the least, because we're trying people for crimes against humanity, and one of the judges of, of, of these people are, is the Soviet Union. <laughs> Yeah, talk about crimes against humanity. Yeah, talk about some big oh, whoppers. And, you know, I had some transcripts at one time of those trials. Mm-hmm. And when you go through there and you read, uh, it's like, you know, it really sets your hair on fire, Joseph. Oh, it does. Why didn't they ask this question? Yes. Look at that question. That leads right into this, but they right. didn't ask that question. Right. right. You know, I mean, it was a sham. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. But to the world, it looked like so serious. It, you know, it was it was retribution and it was yeah. uh, justice, and, and it may have been, and it probably was in many of those cases. Yeah. You know, Kaltenbrenner and and uh, yeah. people of that ilk. Yeah. Uh, but uh, by the same token, uh, I'm not terribly pleased that some of the people passing judgment. Yeah. On these criminals yeah. are representatives of Joseph Stalin. <laughs> you know, I just, I just do not see the morality in that. Well, yeah. Please tell the people, in case they don't know, how many people Stalin's regime was responsible oh, for e- easily, genocide. Easily, easily around sixteen to twenty-five million. We don't really know. Yeah. Because again, you know, the Soviet Union's uh, record keeping was kind of. Uh, tailored to fit the political mood of the moment, yeah. <laughs> you know, which varied on what kind of mood Stalin woke up in at the time. And this guy is in there yeah. at the Nazi trials, and he has yeah. power. Uh, you know, see, it's, it's. Uh, I can't say it, Joseph. Oh, no, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, 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 as, it's in its way, in its oh. way, in its pretense at legality. Yeah. It's in its way as criminal oh, yeah. as the very regime that it claimed to be putting on trial. Yeah, well, that's why they wear black robes, you know. Yeah, well. Because <laughs> they belong to Satan. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's just, it's just uh, you know, the oh. whole World War II, um, any, way, any way you slice it, it just, uh, I think, did so much spiritual damage to oh, yeah. humanity. You know, yeah. you, you had... Uh, a brilliant people and culture like the Germans that were subjected to this hideous regime yeah. that Western bankers helped put into power. There's no denying it. Yeah. And, you know, it fights this just uh, enormous war with another brutal regime in right. the Soviet Union that the Western bankers helped put into power. Right. <laughs> you know? it's, 
<laughs> and I think they want to put into power somebody that just recently gave a speech there in Berlin. Oh, well, yeah. There's no doubt in my mind. You know, and... Uh, mind you, I, I, I'm not... I'm not terribly. Uh, I'm certainly not a fan of bo. No, me and, neither. <laughs> <laughs> me neither. And I'm certainly not a fan of, of Senator McClone. No. Or pardon me, McCain. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not voting for either the Democrats or the Republican crooks me because, neither. as far as I'm concerned, that's a vote for the same system that, that's responsible for all of this. You well, know, yeah. How can you vote for Satan? A po- <laughs> yeah, a pox on both your houses. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but. You know, people just have to wake up, and I think they are, finally, to the fact that, you know, these two political parties are two sides of the same Wall Street-controlled coin. coin. Yeah, And the coin itself isn't even silver or gold. It's, you know, alloy metal that's been whipped up out of thin air by the Federal Reserve, which they own. Yeah. Which isn't even supposed to be there, but, you know, hey, who's who's paying too much attention to that old document? But, uh, you know, it's interesting. They call this person that gave the speech there in Berlin, Berlin recently. Mm-hmm. Um, Farrakhan says, oh, the Messiah is speaking. Well, mm-hmm. y- you remember they called Hitler the Messiah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And you see these women swooning in, you know, over uh, uh, B.O. Um, th- they did the same thing at the Nuremberg rallies. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the glazed look in their eyes. Oh, yeah. and the you know, it, it, it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the 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 techniques of mass hypnotism yes. that that Bo uses in his speeches are really quite practiced and studied. Oh yeah. So you know, it's uh, to my mind, the resemblance is all too palpable. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can look um, at some of the symbolisms of his campaign, and if you look closely, you'll see some very significant esoteric themes at work as well. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's the same old shell game all over again. You'd think that you'd think that these elites would get qu- uh, kind of tired of playing them because we certainly are. Oh yeah. You know, they're, they're not working anymore. Uh, right. People, too many people now see through them. And incidentally, speaking of bo, um, you know, in computer terms, that stands for back orifice. Well, it also stands for body odor, you know. And, yeah, I know. You know, I, I you know, I, I always like to point out that's what his initials are. So yes. anyway, <laughs> if uh, if you go to Germany right now, you don't. Do you know what one of the best-selling books in Germany is? No. Webster Tarpley's Obama Nation. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Well, God bless Webster. Well, you know, and the Germans that are snapping it up and reading it. Yeah. Uh, because let's look again at the symbolism. The Germans are not uh, any more or less bigoted, I think, as a, a population than any other country on Earth. Right. But they are German. Okay? And it's very interesting, and I go into this at great length in the, in the Nazi International, the types of laws that the Bundestag passed after reunification. They even amended their constitution so that it used to be you could go to Germany and claim political asylum from anywhere on earth, and thus they began to get all of these minorities. Well, they got rid of that. Uh, Germany is, as you can tell from what I showed you, returning to some old cultural traditions. Yes. Okay? And I think if you look at the symbolism of him giving that speech in Berlin... Yeah to a German who is, once again, able to be proud of their country. Yeah. Okay? And what it has accomplished, especially in the last ten years. You know, no one thought the reunification would happen. Right. But it did. Uh, Some interesting machinations concerning it, but I won't go into those. But to see that symbol of a minority race in Germany... Mm -hmm parading with those types of symbols in that setting ultimately in my opinion has got to rankle on any german of of any traditional german cultural sentiment so again and the same thing incidentally in france you know oh, yes. uh, the french are are just about 
up to their earlobes with having to be the wonderful social democracy and welcoming all of these immigrant workers and so on and so forth and yeah. to be tolerant of their ways. The French are about up to their earlobes with it. You betcha. And who can blame them? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I certainly don't. And, again, it is not as if France is a racist country because, you know, the Algerian French, many of whom were black African, right. were given the choice by de Gaulle to either, you know, you can be citizens here in France or stay down there in Algeria. You know, it's up to you. Yeah. This is not uh, a racist thing. It's a cultural thing, and it's important for American people to understand, understand that. It. Yes. Uh, and we have this, family there. Yeah. Uh -huh. In France? Yes. Well, you know, I'm I'm part French, and uh, my grandmother was full French. Yeah. And uh, mine too. Yeah, and you know, it, there is a definite um, cultural loyalty that yeah. they have, rightly so. Yes. And I think if you look carefully behind the scenes, globalism is collapsing in the sense that this attempt to create this big, multicultural, tolerant global village people have just had about enough of it because what it's always translated into is we've got to deny our culture which is the majority culture in whatever land we live in and accept some fringe element yeah exactly some foreign yes. element as being the defining feature of our culture well nonsense exactly Jesus. and you know the yes. symbolism there i think with him going over there and giving that speech in that place yeah. <laughs> you know, with all of those all of those symbols yes. <laughs> you know, of people like frederick the great uh -huh. <laughs> Johann sebastian bach and people like that hanging around and hovering in the cultural air yes. uh i think that may be, be a big backfire in Good. the long term as uh -huh. far as europe is concerned we'll see you know mm -hmm. time will tell but uh, it's, uh, I'm less concerned about what I see going on on the continent in, in those two nations as I am in Great Britain. I mean, my word, what's happened to the British? Oh, my God. They're even more sheep than we are. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, I'm kind of dumbfounded there. This is, this, is, this is not the Britain that I remember living in, you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. Yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> It is it's pathetic. Yeah, it really what, is. you know, and these things have been done intentionally oh, sure. to these uh the British and the French and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's uh, it's all uh contrived and of course. You know, and it brings about uh spontaneous um violence. Yeah. Well, you know, the lesson of history seems not to have been learned by our elite. You cannot take Proud peoples like the Chinese or the right. Russians or the Germans right. or the French that have these long and incredibly intricate histories mm -hmm. and that have given so much to the world from their culture right. and rub their faces in the mud and make them slaves to your stock certificates and liens and derivatives and mortgages and interest rates and interbank lending rates and all of this wonderful claptrap. Oh, yeah. You can't keep doing it forever That's right. and expect there not to be a backlash. And the more you do it, the greater the chances that that backlash, when it comes, will be um, not academic. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. Well, Joseph, God bless you. You too. <laughs> God bless us. <laughs> and please protect us. <laughs> oh, yes. And uh, you and I have to do some more work on our private files right. that we are working on together. Right. Give Right now, give out people, give your contact information and the mm -hmm. name of your books okay. uh, so they can call up and get them. Okay, well, to contact me, they can they can basically go to uh, my website, which is uh, www.gizadestar.com, and then just click the contact button and email me. I do request that if they email me, please, please, please use all capitals in the subject header because I get an, now an enormous amount of email. Yeah. And this lets me know that it's someone that's trying to contact me and talk to me rather than, you know, spam or, or 
you know, just yeah. the, the ordinary junk email that you get. Uh, the books are, right now I have seven out, soon to be nine. Wow. And in order of publication, they are the Giza Death Star, the Giza Death Star Deployed, Reich of the Black Sun, the Giza Death Star Destroyed, the SS Brotherhood of the Bell, the Cosmic War, and Secrets of the Unified Field. All of those books are available from Adventures Unlimited Press, and the number there is 1-800-718-4514. Please call during uh, normal business hours. There is a 10% discount on orders of three or more books they can also you know go to their Barnes and Noble or Borders or Amazon and, and order from there if they prefer um, I have two books coming out yes. uh, the order that they're coming out in is not the order they were written in the Philosopher's Stone was written first that will be available sometime I suspect around February from Feral House which is F-E-R-A-L in uh, Port Townsend, Washington, I, I would assume that they're accepting some pre-orders now. Yeah. And then the Nazi International, which is supposed to be out in November, uh, is also available from Adventures Unlimited Press. And again, that's uh, 1-800-718-4514. And if people go to my website, they can actually kind of, pardon me, they can see the, the uh, cover art for those two new books. Yes, and I uh, please ask the audience, uh, Joseph Farrell is a very special researcher, very special man, and it's not often that we have been privileged to have this kind of person doing this kind of research, and I ask you, please make use of that PayPal button on Joseph Farrell's website. And you can find that at GizaDeathStar.com. Help support uh, Joseph Farrell. We need him researching and writing books. He has done more to unravel this... Mess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know what to call it, Joseph. It, it's it's extraordinary. Um, you have... The work you've done is just it is above and beyond. It just, oh my gosh. Well, thank you. I, pre I do try and I do try and footnote and reference things very carefully. Yes. And, and, uh, You're very meticulous. Uh, well, thank you. Well, everybody, God bless you that are listening, and get a hold of Joseph Farrell's work. Again, you can uh, email Joseph directly on his website. He's a Death Star, and while you're there. You make use of that PayPal button, or Joseph and I are going to have to stop doing these free uh, <laughs> Cosmic War audio files. <laughs> and uh, don't forget the Byte Show uh, right. is supporting because uh, we need support. Donate there, too. Absolutely. Yes. We need as many alternative sources of news and information right now more than we ever did. And, oh, yeah. And uh, I, I wholeheartedly second that. <laughs> oh, yes. So you better be praying, folks. <laughs> That's all. That too. <laughs> and hold on to your rear side because you, you, it's going to be a wild ride. God bless you all. Good night. The Bite Show is sponsored by Deep Cello Coffee. Perhaps the best coffee on this or any other planet. The Byte Show is listener-supported at thebyteshow.com.